Hi everyone and welcome back to Fire and Done Film. It's been a while since I've done one of these required learning episodes and usually what I would do is I'd record this required learning episode, I would then follow it up with a commentary for the same film, but I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to just do one kind of required learning bundle, no commentary to go with it, and it's basically a kind of knee-jerk response to a change that I've recently made in my teaching. So... Many of you will be aware, those of you that follow the podcast and those of you that are film students and film teachers, and if, again, if you follow the podcast, that the films that I was teaching were um, Rebel Without a Cause, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Whiplash, District 9, Sotsy, and Attack the Block. Now, there are still required learning episodes and commentary episodes for all of those set texts on the podcast feed and on the YouTube channel. But one decision that I decided to make quite late into this academic year and for my current year nines going into year 10 and my current year 10s going into year 11 is that I wanted to take out Attack the Block. Now, there are a number of different reasons for this, and it's it's definitely not the fact that it's ill-resourced. There is a plethora of resources out there to support somebody teaching Attack the Block and to support a student studying Attack the Block, including some fantastic booklets written and developed and created by Ian Moreno Melgar, who accompanied me on the required learning episode for Attack the Block. The reason why I decided to switch to Skyfall, if I'm honest, was a late Sunday night and Skyfall was on ITV and I flicked it over and I just reminded myself of how beautiful this film is in terms of its cinematography and everything else. So I started to look at a number of different things. I started to look at, again, to be honest, were my students in the past had done well and were they'd done less so. And there seemed to be a bit of a trend and it seemed to be that they would drop a couple of points on Attack the Block. Now, whether that's because it was the last question and maybe I'm still going to get the same thing with Skyfall, but I just thought it's not going to hurt anyone if I change the film and see how it goes. So this is the film that I'm now doing. And obviously to support that and to support my students who may be listening, I'm, I've done this required learning episode to take everything that I teach and kind of put it out there. Now, usually what would happen is that the required learning would form um, the, uh, sorry, the basis of the required learning would come from my PowerPoints, the lessons that I do and the lessons that I teach. And then the commentary would be from the key sequence analysis lessons. Now, what I'm going to do with this, again, to essentially save me, save me a job of recording the commentary, is I'm going to bundle it all together. So I'm going to go through the required learning, the typical required learning, and then I'm going to go through some key scenes um, and essentially things from the fact sheet that you were, may have already seen. So we're going to kick off then. Skyfall. Skyfall was released in 2012. It was directed by Sam Mendes. It is the 23rd James Bond film and the third starring Daniel Craig. The release of the film coincided with the franchise's 50th anniversary and the film was a huge success, some referring to it as a return to form for the series and it had gone on to gross $1.109 billion worldwide. So why do we study Skyfall? So as you know, paper two of the Film Studies GCSE focuses on films from around the world. Question three of that paper is the question on a contemporary UK film. For this question, we need to consider the use of all elements of film form in Skyfall, as well as the context surrounding the film. As well as these required elements, there's a focus on aesthetics for this question, meaning that we'll be typically asked to consider the use of aesthetics, specifically lighting, colour, cinematography and mise-en-scene, or anything that generally makes up the look of the film, including the genre, in relation to Skyfall. The typical layout of question three and all the other questions on paper two is that there are three or four stepped questions about either the focus for that film, in this case aesthetics, or some element of film form, cinematography, sound, editing, mise en scene, or contexts and how they are used in Skyfall. You'll first be asked to identify an element and then briefly describe it. You may be asked to discuss how this element is typically used before creating a 15 mark response, which is usually an overall exploration of that question's specific focus. So in this case, aesthetics. I'm not going to go through any model answers. And the big plan is that I'm going to do a whole podcast on maybe model answers or tips and things like that uh, to tackle when we come round to exam season again. Um, but the idea of these stepped questions is that they have to ease you into writing longer responses and that they link in with each other. Now, what I mean by that is that if you've answered, for example, question A, which again, an example might be, identify an element of cinematography and you've identified a close-up or a high angle or a low angle shot 
And then B usually says something like, explain how this is used in the sequence. Now, when it says explain how this is used, it's expecting you to go back to your answer for question A. That might seem obvious, but it has been known to trip a couple of people up in the past. And finally, again, another thing that might seem obvious, the term from your chosen film, which might come up on the exam paper, has been to be no, has been has, excuse me has been to know to be thrown people off in the past. There are a couple of um, things again, like wording that can kind of throw people off every now and again, especially the term chosen film. But to kind of explain that a little bit, there are a total of five films or five pairings of films that the exam board provide us teachers with. And then we pick one of those films or pairings to teach you in the exam. So your chosen film in this case is Skyfall from the selection of the five that you will see on your exam paper. So where can you find a copy of Skyfall then? So the film is available to buy online from around about $8.99 from iTunes, Sky Store, Google Play and Rotucan. You can also rent the film from those providers for about half the price of a purchase. If you would prefer the old school way of doing things, a new and sealed copy of the DVD is £1.90 on Amazon and the Blu-ray is just £3.76. But, and I think more so than any other film that I teach, Skyfall always does the rounds on ITV and ITV2. It tends to be one of those films similar to something like Hot Fuzz where it's just on a lot. And last year, I remember specifically at Christmas, they went through the Craig Bond era. So they did Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, Skyfall, Spectre. I would assume that they're going to do it again this year. So keep an eye on it. It might be worth just recording it the once. If you've got like a Skybox or a Freeview Plus box, giving it a record and then just sticking it there. But I would say that's probably the easiest way that you're going to get to it. And of course, there are a lot of clips scattered around on YouTube, including on the aforementioned Ian Moreno Melgar's YouTube channel. Um, but there are definitely things that you can access much more easier for Skyfall than you would do some of the other films that we study. So we're going to get into the contexts. Uh, so thinking, first of all, about the institutional context. So the first James Bond film, James Bond is this huge franchise. It's been around for an extremely long amount of time. The first James Bond film was called Dr. No, and it was released in 1962. The character of James Bond is based on Ian Fleming's books. And so far... This is including No Time to Die. There have been 25 films released in the franchise. It has a worldwide combined gross of $7 billion, and the James Bond franchise as a whole is the fourth highest grossing film franchise in history. Now, to take it kind of round to Daniel Craig and the institutional context for Daniel Craig, on the 14th of October 2005, Daniel Craig was revealed to be the next James Bond. There was significant controversy following the decision. Internet campaigns such as DanielCraigIsNotBond.com expressed the dissatisfaction and threatened to boycott the film in protest. What I'm going to do now is I want to play a clip from a Sky News article, article or report about Daniel Craig being announced as James Bond. Now, for the people behind the world's most famous spy, it was the worst kept secret in showbiz. But today, the actor Daniel Craig was officially unveiled as the new James Bond. Sky's entertainment correspondent Matt Smith caught up with him. Like a scene straight out of a Bond movie, 007, number six was delivered to the world's media today by the Royal Marines. The speculation had proved to be right. 37 year old Englishman Daniel Craig is to play the world's most famous spy. I had a confidence about it, but then that's just my, I, I, because of the people around me and I felt good about it. But I, didn't, I knew positively when Monday, it was Monday, yeah, I was in Baltimore and I got the phone call. And when you got the phone call, what was, what was your reaction? Tell us, talk um, us through that. I need a drink. <laughs> Daniel Craig landed the job after his breakthrough role as a cocaine dealer in gangster Brit flick Layer Cake, impressing the Bond producers with his on-screen presence. Alongside Craig, some 200 actors were considered for the part in a search that took two years to complete. I think it is the right choice. I think Daniel Craig has a wonderful originality. He's not a Brosnan clone. He's got a sort of edge. He's got a presence on screen. He's got a mystique about him. Daniel Craig will find the job is changing a bit, though. There'll be less leaping about as producers want him to be a younger, sharper spy with no gadgets. Daniel, Daniel. Daniel. 
And away from the world's photographers, in a special Sky News interview, the new man in the job told me what his bond would be like. Good, <laughs> I hope. Um, I, I'm just, I, well, me, that's what it's going to be. I mean, that's, I'm going to bring myself to it, and hopefully that's going to be something that's going to be watchable and um, entertaining and exciting. You know, I mean, I've just got to, got to work on that. So after months of fevered speculation, the spy is finally out in the open. Daniel Craig is the new James Bond. Matt Smith, Sky News, East London. Okay, so... As was kind of alluded to there, there was a big hunt for a new James Bond, it included actors such as Colin Farrell and uh, Clive Owen, who was, I think, the bookie's favourite at one point. But Daniel Craig, unlike previous actors who played James Bond, was not considered by the protesters who sort of spoke out against it to fit that sort of tar tall, dark and handsome and charismatic image of James Bond. The Daily Mirror ran a front-page news story critical of Craig with the title, The Name's Bland, James Bland. So obviously there's a lot of assumption as to what's going to happen with the James Bond films with Daniel Craig at the helm. Something that I wanted to kind of flag up and that I flagged up in my lessons. So this links to toxic fan ownership culture, something which I've spoken about on the podcast before. People who have grown accustomed to a certain thing being a certain way or portrayed in a certain way and friends and fans even threatening to boycott it if they don't like it. Just ever think about how influential of a voice you think fans have in possibly changing things. Because this was 2006, maybe even 2005, when it was announced that James Bond was going to be played by Daniel Craig. And obviously there was a big outpouring, there was a lot of people not happy about it. But if I think of something a bit more recent, like, for example, Sonic the Hedgehog, when fans of the video game and of the character of Sonic first got a look at what Sonic was going to look like in the film, there was this huge outpouring of like an uproar online and it essentially forced the producers to change the way that Sonic looked. They went back and changed things about it. Are we in a position now where, heaven forbid, the next James Bond gets announced, people don't like it, and then producers change it? What does that do about toxic fan ownership on these things? Who has the strength anymore? Is it the fans? Is it the producers? So moving into Skyfall. So obviously we've mentioned Skyfall was released in 2012. It was directed by Sam Mendes. It is the 23rd James Bond film and the third Daniel Craig film. Sam Mendes was approached to direct after the release of Quantum of Solace in 2008. Development was suspended when MGM ran into financial trouble and did not resume until MGM emerged, emerged from bankruptcy in December of 2010. Meanwhile, the original screenwriter Peter Morgan left the project, and when production resume, resumed, screenwriting, the screenwriting trio of Logan, Purvis and Wade continued writing what became the final version of the script. Filming began in November of 2011, primarily in the UK, with smaller portions shot in China and Turkey. Now, something that I kind of bring attention to in my teaching is that there are a couple of things that have become accustomed to James Bond over the years, things that you expect from James Bond. Things like gadgets, things like his cars, and this was quite iconic for him to bring back the Aston Martin and things like that. And I wanted to sort of shine a light on three things. So the Bond theme, and I, I'm kind of of an age more with these ones, where I remember the whole who row about who it is that's singing the next Bond theme, who's going who's gonna to sing this one, who's going to sing this one. And Adele's Skyfall at the time was a huge hit, absolutely huge hit, um, sung by Adele, written by Adele and Paul Etworth. And it was one of those things that people look forward to about James Bond's film. I remember when Spectre came out as well, and it was a big kind of who it is, we're going we're gonna to call who it is who sang the Bond theme this time. And even like Billie Eilish being revealed as being the singer of No Time to Die's theme song, there was a big kind of hoorah about that. Just showing you the kind of place that Bond and the Bond franchise holds in commonplace cinema. The other two are the Bond villain and the Bond girl. Now, I'd always been brought up to know that, you know, the kind of big thing about a James Bond film is who they're going to cast as the villain, who they're going to cast as the Bond girl, as a kind of woman of, who gets Bond's affection. And actually, I think it played into the narrative somewhat that f for as you watch the film, we get introduced to Severin 
and obviously she's the Bond girl. And then there's a point in the film where she's kind of dispatched, she's done away with, and then replaced by Silver, Javier Badem Silver, the villain. And I just thought the narrative structure of, even if it was a, even if it was not intentional, but the idea that there's potentially been a subconscious thing where the producers or the writers have, have kind of gone, well, we've got this Bond girl, which we need, and then we've got this Bond villain. So what we'll do is instead of mixing the two, we'll mix them very sort of subtly and a little bit in the middle of it, but we'll do away with one of them because we can't have a focus on both. I think that's quite interesting to consider the way that the narrative structure was used there. Um, so obviously because it's a James Bond film, it had a huge kind of uh, lead into it. There was a press conference announcing people that were going to be in it and announcing um, other things to do with that. The budget was between 150 and 200 million. It was very well received by critics upon release. It won several accolades, including two Academy Awards, two BAFTA Awards and two Grammy Awards. It was the 14th film to gross over a billion worldwide. And it is so far at that point, anyway, the only James Bond film to do so. It became the seventh highest grossing film of all time, the highest grossing film in the UK, the highest grossing film in the series, and the highest grossing film worldwide for both Sony Pictures and MGM, and the second highest grossing film of 2012. Um, A little bit of a side note, I was working in a cinema when this film was released, and it was extremely, extremely busy. It opened on a Monday, which isn't the usual day for films. I'm sure you all can agree on that. And we got to a point where we had to take other films off just to put more Skyfall on because the demand was insane. And it was this weird thing where I think, because Quantum of Solace was released in 2008 and it didn't do very well. And I think there was enough time between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall where people thought, oh, actually... This we've kind of rejuvenated the Bond franchise now, and people were so eager to go and see it. And there were people there who I remember having conversations with um, an older gentleman who told me that he only went to the cinema to watch Bond films, and that was literally the only time that he'd ever go out to the cinema and go and watch a film to watch Bond. And he was there opening day to go and watch Bond, so he'd waited four years between that. So, this again is a huge sort of franchise that we're talking about here. So if we go into the social context for a little bit, so a key theme throughout the film is the representation of age and tradition versus youth and modernity. Um, So a key theme of the film is whether Bond and M and their agency are out of step with what's more technological in the modern world. In Judi Dench's first film as M, she branded Bond a dinosaur. So are they now at the point where they are powerless to the point of incompetence? So there's a lot of jabs in the film about whether or not Bond can use a gadget and whether or not he's getting a little bit old and his knees are creaking and things like that. Um, One scene that does this really well is the scene where Bond meets the new Q, where he meets him in National Gallery. Gallery, Even they are interpreting a turnip in very differently. Q says, once great ship towed to the junkyard. 007 ex- ignores the complexity and the nuance and says, I just see a bloody great big ship. Now, again, that links to, so Q seeing it as, oh, the one's great ship. Now it's a little bit old. It's being towed for scrap. And Bond's just like, yeah, I just see a big bloody, sh- bloody ship at the end of the day. Which, again, his blunter and his straightforward approach links to possibly what's needed to defend against this new breed of cyber criminal. So arguably Bond's response is straight to the point, perhaps reflective of the old style British stiff upper lip, whereas Q is much younger, metaphorical. You know, he's new to the world. He's seeing the difference in everything, whereas Bond's very much like, no, it's not that I see it this way. This could be reflective of the filmmakers acknowledging that, yes, Bond is 50 in terms of how long the films have been released, but we need to strike a balance of old school sensibility and new tech states of mind. And that's the way that they're going to kind of try and address it. If we link to the historical context for a little bit, so in Skyfall, the references to Bond's past haunting the present come through the source of danger, so silver, and his power. And there are things like the Walter PPK gun, the Aston Martin, the Skyfall estate estate from his childhood, uh, which all provide fresh elements, but again, throwback elements to his backstory and maybe the fact that he is being haunted by his past. 
Now, one thing when I was looking into teaching Skyfall that kind of gripped me into, oh, yeah, you definitely want to teach this. You'll enjoy getting your teeth into this. Uh, the similarities between Skyfall, James Bond franchise at that time, and two other successful franchises that were re- rebooted around the same time. And, of course, I'm talking about Batman in Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy and the what we're going to refer to as the Kelvin timeline of the Star Trek films. So Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. So all three, so your Bond franchise, so your Craig Bond, so things like Skyfall, and then later Spectre, and then No Time to Die. Your Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises. Your Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. All three of them take familiar characters that have grown almost comical and add a little bit of depth. They've taken these characters where you have the crew of the uh, USS Enterprise, you have Batman, who was made extremely comical in the late 1970s, in the late 1990s, and you take James Bond, who Pierce Brosnan-wise definitely was becoming a little bit more comical, and you give them a little bit more depth, you give them a little bit more humanity, you make things darker, you add some more complex themes, and you cleverly balance these new perspectives, these new elements with iconography that we recognise. So things that we recognise from each of these franchises' pasts. So with Batman, it is this rogues gallery of villains that he has open to. Everybody knows who the Joker is. Everybody knows who Penguin is. And you use things like that to come back to it. And obviously no one didn't use Penguin. He started to look at people like Scarecrow or Bane and things like that. But he, he pinned it down in the fact that people know who Batman is. They know who Bruce Wayne is. Similar with things like Star Trek, they know who Spock is. So they go back and they use Leonard Nimoy's Spock. They know the kind of beats of an old Star Trek episode. They recognise the actor, uh, the the characters in the, in people like Bones and Ahura. And then when you get to James Bond, that's when you're going to throw in the PPK gun. That's when you're going to throw in the Aston Mine and things like that. So the the interesting comparisons to make. Now, I'm going to come back to Skyfall and James Bond and the Dark Knight trilogy in just a little bit. But one thing that we need to kind of focus on is the aesthetics of Skyfall. Now, again, this is freely available on the fact sheet provided by Edgecast, but I'm just going to kind of talk you through it now. So the film is an accomplished fusion of character, theme and visual style. Though the cinematography and the production design is striking, it's more than just style or the substance. There are three key visual motives throughout Skyfall. The first is that there is a color scheme that goes from blue cold colours, to orange, more warmer colours. And this was first introduced in, in Casino Royale. There's a really good video on YouTube called How Casino Royale Cinematography Changed Bond's Visual Style. I show it in my lessons. I recommend you go and watch it if you've not yet seen it. The second key visual motif is mirrors, doubles and reflections. And the third is Bond or M being in the centre. So we go back to the first one. We go back to the blue and the orange colour scheme. So the blue and orange colour scheme symbolises the thematic conflict between the new and the digital age and the old school espionage of chases, fisticuffs and gunfights. Electric blues in scenes like Shanghai, the beautiful Shanghai scene, represent the virtual power of technology. It's bright, it's shiny, it's intangible and it's distracting. But the orange and the brown when he gets to um, the Macau scene, symbolises the tangible, if physically dangerous, or dirty realism of the solid world that Bond is an expert in negotiating. So it's that kind of gruff, ground, earthy kind of colour, but supported by a warm, a warmness that isn't seen in the technological blue colours. So essentially what we're saying here is that blue is the modern the new digital technology virtually it's cold and it's faceless and it's to Bond's distaste. So there are a lot of images in the film where Q's looking at a number of different screens and that's the blue. That's where the blue comes in. The orange is linking to the physicality, the tradition, the old style spy craft. It's more warmer because it's to Bond's preference. It might be that us as, let's face it, a younger audience, a more alert to the blue, 
and more kind of drawn into the technological aspects of it. And maybe the reason why, and I might just be speaking for myself at you, the reason why I like these more modern bonds is because they're incorporating things like that. And I'm more drawn to the blues and things like that. Maybe the reason why I like the Shanghai scene so much is because it's all that neon blueness. But this, this orange aesthetic and this warmness is because it's warm to the character, it's warm to Bond, it's familiarity to Bond, and it's his preference. So the old threat of the orange to the digital world of the blue. So mirrors, doubles, and reflections. So we're talking here about the symmetrical composition of many of the shots and the use that actual reflections symbolise two things. The way that the actual and the virtual words are connected, so again, in these kind of reflections, and the connection between silver and bond, what happens there between those two characters. So again, another Dark Knight comparison, and again, my students will be knowing the reason why I've decided to start teaching this, and anyone who listens to the podcast will be knowing why I've started decided to start teaching this. Um, so we're talking specifically about Bond and Silver, and they're both agents who overstep the mark. Both have been portrayed by M in the service of the country, much like Batman and Joker in The Dark Knight, the two sides of the same coin. And again, if you were to go and watch The Dark Knight and see the relationship between Batman and the Joker, and then compare it to Silver and James Bond. There's a lot of similarities there. So the next visual motif, uh, so Bond or M in the centre of the frame. There's a consistent framing of shots that places Bond or M at the centre and establishes them as a stable, dependable presence in a changing, chaotic world, reassuring the audience of their relevance. The second to last scene of Bond staring out over London suggests that he's a champion and a protector of Britain, a shot familiar from a superhero film. The presence of other national flags flying above the embassies suggests that he's also a protector of the whole world. So again, this use of metaphorical, linking to the character of Q, linking to this newness, this kind of youthful nature that they're trying to get across in the film. So oh, I mentioned before that I'm going to come back to The Dark Knight and the similarities between The Dark Knight and Skyfall. Um, and there's an article written by Lewis Wallace on September 11th, 2012, on wired.com. And this would have been around the time, I say September 11th, I believe actually it would have been the 9th of November because it would have been a US day instead. So my apologies for that. Um, it's, it's called 10 Ways Skyfall Borrows from the Dark Knight Playbook. Now, what... Lewis is talking about here isn't just the film of the Dark Knight, he's talking about the whole trilogy. So there are 10 things that he's pulled out that I'm going to read back to you now. And if you've seen the Dark Knight, if you've seen the trilogy and you're familiar with it, a lot of these things may make sense to you. So a pulse pounding opening. Start with a bang. It's a classic cinematic power play and a Bond staple. Both the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises hit viewers hard with intense sequences that signal that you're about to see an epic movie. Skyfall does the same, coming out of the gate with a stupendously inventive chase sequence. So if you're not familiar with The Dark Knight, opens with a bank robbery and the reveal of Joker. The Dark Knight Rises begins with the reveal of Bane and quite a, um, what would have been a bit of a logistical nightmare to film, uh, aeroplane sequence. The second thing in Lewis's, Lewis's article is, give Mr. Grimm a sense of humour. For the first time, Skyfall made me actually care about Craig's dull-eyed take on Ian Fleming's super spy. The actor loosens up in this film, cracking wise and showing a human side. It's similar to the way that The Dark Knight Rises added a little bit of humour to Christian Bale's scowl and cowl performance, but much more effective. I remember Nolan coming out in an interview saying that there were no time for jokes in films like that. And then you get a scene like in Dark Knight Rises where he's talking to Catwoman on a roof and Catwoman just disappears and he goes, oh, so that's how that feels. So again, you know, they're, they're trying it there, but it's, it's done much more better or successfully, as, as Lewis says in um, Skyfall. So bring the good guy back from the brink to save his city. At the beginning of The Dark Knight Rises, Bruce Wayne is depicted as a crippled up recluse. Later, he miraculously recuperates from a broken back. In Skyfall, Bond goes missing, is presumed dead, but he's actually licking his wounds and playing killer drinking games on a beach somewhere. 
He's beaten down and only gets pulled back into the game after a terror attack on his beloved London. Batman's motivation, as always, is to save Gotham. Put your hero in a hole as a boy. Here's a bit of a weird theme for you. Bruce Wayne fell into a cave full of bats as a boy, a traumatic experience that made a mark on his psyche. A young James Bond, as revealed in Skyfall, spent two days in a priest hole after his parents' death. When he emerged, he was changed forever. Now, that's not actually shown on screen. That's referenced in the dialogue. But again, there are a lot of similarities here. There are a lot of different things that are coming out here. So give the hero a hot set of wheels. No one's Batman has the tumbler and the bat pod. Bond keeps a vintage Aston Martin DB5 in his garage. The first glimpse of the Immaculate Automobile will get 007 gearheads revving. So again, that throwback to the past. Make the villain memorable. Casting Javier Bardem as the psychotic cyber terrorist Silver might not have been the masterstroke of putting Heath Ledger in the Joker's smeared makeup, but it's damn close. Bardem plays Skyfall's big bad with the same sort of relish, turning Silver into a Bond villain for the ages. This twisted character might have been all camp in a lesser actor's hands. I only wish Bardem had gotten more screen time. And finally, end with a wink at the future. At the end of Batman Begins, no one played the Joker card. So again, if you've not seen Batman Begins, at the end of the film, he says, what about this one? And you reveal a Joker card, cliffhanger for the future. In the final minutes of The Dark Knight Rises, we get a hint at a possible Bat future with the last minute character reveal. So all the way through, John Blake, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character, finally reveals at the end that his name is actually Robin. The same sort of thing happens in Skyfall, giving us a glimpse at the franchise's promising future, where he goes in and sees Naomi Harris, his character, and she reveals that actually she's called Moneypenny and that the new M is Ray Fiennes' his character. So, let's go into some key sequences then. So again, if you're one of my students, you will know that the key sequences that we look at are the opening sequence, the Shanghai sequence, and Silver's Lair. Uh, Shanghai is essentially mainly done just so I can show everybody how pretty that scene is and to once again reiterate about the orange and the blue colour palettes but the opening then so Skyfall opens unusually for a Bond film instead of the rolling circle ident and that kind of classic Bond walking through a circle there's just a silhouette of a figure he's out of focus he strides him forward into focus but only with a patch of light illuminating his face this links to the theme of MI6 working in the shadows as M says later the shot composition is symmetrical with Bond in the centre, and this is a motif repeated throughout the film. Additionally, the cinematographer Roger Deakins uses kinetic camera movement to follow the action, but keeps the camera steady, which suggests that Bond is in control of the situation despite the chaos that the chase creates. It's very similar to the Bond films, this opening sequence. All the elements of the generic sequence, chase sequence are thrown into the mix here, so you get chases on foot, car, bike and train, with bystanders dodging the carnage, other vehicles crashing, windows to crash through, bridges and rooftops to fall off, all adding to the sense of danger. Mostly typical but very effective, there's a mix of a whole range of shots and angles, close-ups, mid-shots, point-of-view shots, used to emotionally engage and immerse us into the action. The long shot and the extreme long shot of the helicopter shots are shown later to show the larger scale action. The London headquarters has large screens and computer monitors that surveil the action from afar. The two colour palettes are used in the two locations. So again, your oranges, your browns, your dust is chaotic versus the cold navy blues and pale washed out colours in London. So going between the shots create a spectacle. So again, these long shots, these extreme long shots, the helicopter shots create this sense of immersion. Cross-cutting between Istanbul and London is assisted by uh, technology and that he's being held accountable by higher authority in between Bond, London and Eve in the Jeep once the bike chase begins. This introduces the core theme that no matter how advanced surveillance technology has got, there is still a need for field agents to do the more traditional chasing, shooting and fighting. In terms of sound, there's an unusual piece of music in the beginning of the film, so opening two cards, traditional Bond theme, but then it stops, again, suggesting that this might be a different version of the character. And the dialogue is very jokey. There's a lot of quips similar to um, the way that these films have been rebooted. If we move into Silver's Lair, so uh, Severin states that the island city shows Silver's power 
by the use of the technology, but his victory seems lit- literally empty. The, the whole city is actually empty. It looks more like a war-ravaged architecture of somewhere like Aleppo and the glittering technical techno layers of the other Bond villains. So things like You Only Live Twice Volcano and The Spy Who Loves Me with his underwater city. A long shot is used to show the scale of Silver's island layer, but to show the wrecked, crumbling architecture. Shots are composed so that Bond is always in the lower centre of the screen. His central position throughout the film suggests stability, solidity, and even the sense of control when seemingly overwhelmed by elements in the rest of the shot. Severin's explanation of why the island is deserted emphasises the almost godlike power that has been given to Silver. As Bond waits for his new arrival, there are cutaways to his calm face, showing that although he might be a prisoner and surrounded by technology that threatens his ability to protect his country, he's actually calm and almost amused by the familiarity of the situation. When Silver enters his lair later on, there is a single shot of him approaching Bond and does, mirroring the entrance of Bond in the opening shot of the film. As he gets closer, the camera moves to meet him, eventually becoming Bond's point of view. The movement reduces the distance between them, and the proximity creates danger, but also a queasy intimacy, suggesting that the characters aren't that different. Similarly, the heart of his lair is a crumbling hallway filled with dusty servers and wires, far from the bright, clean and glamorous locations that we would come to expect. This is the tawdry reality behind his virtual power. His revelation that M lied about Bond's test scores again asserts that Silver is Bond's dark double, what we previously interpreted as M's pride and confidence in Bond, Silver interprets as betrayal. When we finally meet him, Silver's speech about the rats on his grandmother's island is typically cryptic and sinister, um, and it's also mocked as monologuing, if you've ever seen The Incredibles. So that's kind of it for this episode and the required learning for Skyfall. Obviously, there's more to unpack, there. there's more things to think about, but that's essentially the essence. And I hope there's been enough in there for anyone who's listening back to this as they come to an exam or a test or anything like that or answering a an exam-style question for Skyfall that has jogged your memory on different things that you can include in that answer. So thank you very much for listening. And there's any kind of need or want for a, a commentary, a separate commentary, please let me know, and I will endeavour to try and get one done. But as usual, you can help support Farringdon Film by following us on Twitter at Farringdon Film, by liking us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Farringdon Film, by going over to our sponsor, Offworld Tees, and using the code Farrand, that's F-A-R-R-A-N-D, for 15% off your order, and leaving a five-star review at your favourite podcast provider. Stay safe, look after each other, and I will see you next time.